Virgin Most Powerful Radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity. And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. And welcome everybody to Hands-On Apologetics. I am Gary Machuda, and you have entered into the Virgin Most Powerful's uh, Apologetics Dojo, the Apologetic Zone, where we uh, learn how to explain, defend the faith with clarity, charity, and confidence. And it's great to be with you today. Uh, it's always great to be able to sit down and talk about apologetics, uh, just talk about our Lord and learn more about Him uh, by learning about uh, other belief systems and uh, in fact today we're going to talk about a group that I think probably most of you have already encountered in your neighborhoods maybe at your doorstep uh, riding bicycles perhaps coming two by two uh, we're going to talk about Mormonism and uh, the the Church of Jesus Christ the Latter-day Saints and uh, to help us work through that we're going to have Catholic Brian come on the show and uh, yes, that's why I'm wearing my Catholic shirt today. I don't know if you can see it, but I got my Catholic shirt. Uh, Catholic Brian, Brian Mercer is going to join us. And uh, we were going to talk about what every Catholic ought to know about Mormonism. Uh, it's great to have him back in the show, uh, Dojo, I should say, because uh, he did a great job last few times he was out. Uh, just a really upbeat kind of guy, very knowledgeable and uh, he's also done a lot of work in Mormonism. And in fact, if you check out his uh, YouTube channel, Catholic Brian, you'll see he has a, a handful of videos there that he gets into all the particulars. So we're going to pick his brain and learn about this group and find out, you know, are they Christian? What's their background? What's their history? Things like that. So I think that's going to be a fascinating topic for us to explore today. Also, as always, we, we're going to focus on... Uh, Sharpening our critical thinking skills, and uh, to do, help us do that, we go through finding a fallacy. And since it's Friday, we usually do a propaganda technique, and today's propaganda technique is the appeal to plain folks. That's kind of a fun one. And also, we meet uh, one of the early church fathers every episode, and uh, the early church father for today is actually several, which is a council, <laughs> the Council of Ephesus. AD 431. In fact, this is the council, ladies and gentlemen, where uh, it's, it was defined Mary as mother of God. And we're going to look into the background. Why was the discussion about Mary? What does mother of God mean? Who are the movers and shakers in the council? And uh, so lots of great stuff in store for us today. And as always, you are part of the program, especially when uh, Catholic Brian, Brian Mercer, comes on after the break. Give us a call at 888-526-2151. That's 888-526-2151. Love to hear from you. Also, uh, love to hear from you via email. I know a lot of you uh, are in situations where uh, either you love to share your advice about what to do, what not to do, that what's worked for you, what hasn't worked for you in apologetics, or perhaps you have a question. There's been several great questions in the Dojo mailbox. And in fact, uh, the time is coming where we really should do a mailbox episode and go through all those questions because uh, great stuff. It's filling up, but you know, it's never too late to email us here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio's uh, Hands-On Apologetics Show at questions at handsonapologetics.com. It's questions at handsonapologetics.com. It goes directly to my mailbox. I answer everyone. And sometimes, like I said, sometimes we keep it for the shows. And guess what? It's my favorite time of the day to give my shout-outs to those watching live stream on Facebook and YouTube. Hello, everybody. Great to see familiar names in the chat room. Hi, Jose. Uh, and, uh, and also a shout-out to you listening on radio or perhaps even listening on podcast. Thank you for listening to the program. Hope you're enjoying it as much as I do. I love this. This is my favorite part of the day because not only do I get, like I see on the dojo uh, section of uh, the live feed section of dojo, I should say, the explosion of emojis welcoming me 
uh, the broadcast, but uh, it's also a great time because I'm always learning more and more about the faith, and and uh, I get energized sometimes after the show, especially uh, if I have great guests like Brian Mercer coming on. So why don't we jump into our exercises for today? Since this is a dojo, it's time to work out. And the exercise is defining the fallacy, which, like I said, today is a propaganda technique. And uh, pro- this propaganda technique is called appeal to plain folks. Now, I-, I know a lot of you are very familiar with this. We see it every day in advertising. Sometimes we see it in political ads. In apologetics, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure if we do. I, I would actually really have to think about that. But what is the appeal to playing folks? Well, basically, if you've ever watched cable television or one of those uh, home shopping things, uh, you'll know exactly what it is. It's callers. Callers come up and they're just ordinary Joes, just like you and me, raving about some product. And so the fact that ordinary rank and file people uh, enjoy something or believe something, that can be very appealing because... Most of us uh, will trust our neighbor. We won't trust salesmen. We won't trust politicians. And which brings up the other time when this is usually used. It's usually used with political ads. You know, sometimes you'll find somebody who is a Harvard-trained lawyer and, you know, worked in government their whole life. And and, uh, and then they'll they'll show them in a plaid shirt and blue jeans or something like that, you know, and and talking to a, a bunch of hicks at a local, you know, uh, soda shop, if there is even any soda shops out there anymore. And the whole idea is if we could dress the, the candidate up like a plain folk, like you and me, then we would trust them or her, right? And that is a propaganda technique known as the appeal to plain folks. Uh, so, you know, be aware, folks, uh, with prop- t- propaganda techniques are powerful until you realize it's being used. And that at that point, you kind of peek behind the curtain to see the wizard, and you realize this is all smoke and mirrors. So just it's good to know these things because that's the way you diffuse them. All right, moving on. Let's talk about the Meet the Early Church Father for today, who is not a person but a council, the Council of Ephesus in 80, met in 83, excuse me, 431. Uh, the first and second ecumenical councils at Nicaea, uh, in 325 and also at Constantinople in 381, had uh, defended the divinity of the Son and of the Holy Spirit respectively, and they're consubstantially with the Father. They're one substance with the Father. Uh, but now the discussion by this time had turned to Christology. Exactly who is Jesus? Uh, is the nature of his person and his nature? Does he have one nature, two natures, one person, two persons? Well, the uh, the main figure on the scene is Nestorius. Nestorius uh, was a heretic who believed he, that Jesus had two natures, which is true. But the problem is he wished to separate those two natures so distinctly that he almost makes Jesus into two persons. Uh, the divine person and the human person. And part of that is that he held on to Aristotle's notion that there can't be, uh, with no nature, you can't have a person. So if Jesus had a human nature, he had to have a divine person. So we actually have Jesus's instead of Jesus. And for that reason, he insisted that Mary should not be called Theotokos or mother of God, but she should be called Christotokos or the mother of Christ. So uh, he, his teachings were referred to Rome. And by the way, he had already kind of uh, had some suspicions in Rome because he was uh, giving refuge to a Pelagian heretic known as uh, Celestius. And Rome's decision was against Nestorius. So Nestorius then appeals to the emperor Theodosius II to convoke the Third Ecumenical Council which met at Ephesus in 431. So uh, lots of interesting things happen. Nestorius comes there with 16 of his suffragans, uh, the Bishop of Antioch, Cyril of Antioch on there, John the Patriarch of Antioch, who's a Nestorian sympathizer. However, the three papal legates were delayed because of storms at sea. So Cyril opened the council against the protest of 68 bishops and condemned Nestorius. 
And then finally, when the papal legates come, uh, they pretty much affirm what Cyril had done. And uh, Cyril was excommunicated and sent into exile. Uh, and the emperor basically signed off with that. The uh, Let's see, he... Um, he invited uh, representatives of both uh, Nestorius and Cyril to uh, his court in Chalcedon. And uh, when the uh, representatives failed to agree, he reversed himself, condemned Nestorius, reinstated Cyril of, of Alexandria. Nestorius was sent back to the monastery in Antioch. And uh, basically, uh, he was into ex exile in Arabia, Libya, finally in the desert in Upper Egypt. And hence, Nestorianism was destroyed by the Council of Ephesus. How? Because they referred to Mary as the mother of God. Now, lots of non-Catholics have difficulty with this because they say, well, if Mary's mother of God, then she must be the originator of God. And that's ridiculous because God's eternal. You know, and God is the, doesn't have an originator. Well, that the problem there is because they don't understand that what it refers to is that when God becomes incarnate, uh, Jesus is a divine person with a human nature and divine nature. And when a mother gives birth, she doesn't give birth to a nature, right? I mean, you ever look at a newborn baby and say, oh, what an adorable human, right? <laughs> we say, what an adorable, you know, Billy or Jane or whatever name it is, because they're persons, right? So who does Mary give birth to? She gives birth to a divine person. Therefore, she gives birth to, she is, or excuse me, she is the mother of God. Very good. Coming up on the other side of the break, we're going to talk with Brian Mercer about Mormonism. Stay tuned, everybody. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody. Hands-On Apologetics. 
And uh, yeah, so the Council of Ephesus was our, our uh, Meet the Early Church Father for today. And like I said, it's very important because what it does is it really defines uh, more about Jesus than Mary. Because uh, it defines that Mary was truly his mother. She was the Theotokos. But more importantly, who she gives birth to is God. So, uh, yeah, good stuff. In fact, uh, uh, notions about God are extremely important. And that kind of brings up the subject which we're going to be talking about. We're, we're getting our Augusta on the phone as I speak. But we're going to be talking about Mormonism. Uh, we're familiar with them. Uh, Mormons come to our door. They're usually two very nicely dressed, uh, youngish kind of guys. Uh, and they, they're holding this mysterious book called the Book of Mormon. And uh, they want to talk about, uh, do you know Jesus? Uh, and if you ever invite them in the house, it's it's interesting to talk to them. They're usually very nicely, you know, well-educated, very uh, polite people. And uh, if you ask them, you know, uh, do you, are you Christian? They will say, oh, sure. Yes, we are absolutely Christian because we follow Jesus. And we're just checking around to find out that, you know, see who who follows Jesus. Uh, do you know Jesus? And uh, and they'll invite you very politely to read the Book of Mormon, which is a book that was purported to be written by uh, uh, Joseph Smith uh, via inspiration. So it's another testament about Jesus Christ. And they'll also ask you to pray about it as you read it. And if you ever flip through the Book of Mormon, you'll find out that it does, it sounds like, uh, it sounds like the scripture. In fact, uh, some people have pointed out that it actually plagi uh, it plagiarizes the King James Bible uh, in several places. So it sounds like scripture. It uh, looks like scripture and you pray about it. And uh, they believe that the Holy Spirit will give you a, a certain testimony through which that you will know that it is indeed another testament of Jesus Christ. And uh, so uh, once you buy into that system, then you find out all sorts of interesting peculiarities. But I, I don't want to steal the thunder of our guest, so we'll have to uh, wait till he comes on. Uh, but it's very interesting that a lot of Catholics and other people aren't aware of the background of Mormonism, where it came from. Uh, they also don't know that it isn't considered, not only by Catholics, but Protestants do not consider Mormonism to be a Christian religion. And in fact, Mormonism uh, doesn't hold on to, it isn't strictly monotheistic. It doesn't believe that there is one God and only one God. Uh, they're actually, uh, they believe that there is like one superior God and there's other gods under the God. They also believe that you could become God if you're a good Mormon, and someday that you will uh, people your own, <laughs> you know, you'll be the God of your own planet with people. Uh, they also believe that God the Father has flesh and bones, and that he one time was just an ordinary human who was exalted. All sorts of interesting stuff. But unless you know what to ask, unless you know where, you know, to go, uh, and you, you just start on generalities. You get the impression that, wow, they're just like us. and uh, But they're really not. So uh, that's why I think as Catholics, not only should we be informed about the history of Mormonism, their peculiar beliefs, but we should also be able to talk to our neighbors too. Let them be aware that uh, Mormonism isn't uh, your run-in-the-mill Protestant denomination, that it really is a distinct and a pseudo-Christian religion. And uh, by warning your neighbors, you'll, have, you'll help protect them, you know, because uh, as uh, you always hear on Jesus 911, to be prepared before armed is to, uh, you know, be always ready or always vigilant, always ready, right? And that's part of apologetics too. It's not only that you're aware and equipped to explain the faith to whoever asks you, but also that you um, are able to help others, you know, non-Catholics in the neighborhood. So uh, that's, I guess that's a, a good uh, wind up for Mormonism. So uh, 
Now, did I hear you correctly, Richard? Uh, we're all set? Okay, sounds good. Well, let me introduce the guest. The guest is known as Catholic Brian, Brian Mercer. Brian Mercer is a professional Catholic speaker, a retreat leader, author, and Catholic apologist. He has spoken at countless teens and adults over the 20 years through confession retreat or confirmation retreats, uh, parish missions, keynote talks, Catholic school retreats, seminars, workshops, and so on. He's appeared on Catholic radio, television, EWTN, uh, that's broadcast all over the world. And he's also returning back to the dojo. So welcome back, Brian Mercer. Thank you very much, Gary. Well, it's great to be with you. I was just giving, uh, as we we're getting a hold of you, I, I gave a thumbnail sketch of Mormonism, but no way did I give the complete and total rendition. I, I, well, as I was saying, most Catholics, if they run into a Mormon, uh, they think, think it's just a, you know another Christian, another Protestant denomination, really not much different than us Catholics. That is true. And even up until recently, I'd say about 10 years ago, the Catholic Church, uh, I don't know, I wouldn't say that they thought the same thing, but they definitely didn't seem to teach differently. About 10 years ago, I was speaking with some Mormons in my living room, and out of the blue, they came in week after week. And then one week out of the blue, they came in all offended. And they said, we don't understand, Brian. Your Pope changed the teaching of what you think of Mormons. And he said that the Mormon baptism is not valid anymore. So if a Mormon becomes a Catholic, he has to be rebaptized. Why would the Pope do that? And they said, well, the Pope's looked at your church, and the Pope looked at it a little bit more deeply and what you actually believe, and you actually hold a lot of teachings that are contrary to the Catholic faith and to the Christian faith in general. And for example, the biggest thing would be that you believe in multiple gods. You believe in many gods, in fact. In fact, the Book of Mormon says that Jesus is another god. He's a different being separate from God, but he's also another God. And so when the Catholic Church looks at that, and he looks at the Bible and says there is only one God, but here you have a religion teaching that there are many gods, and even human beings who are alive now can someday maybe get to heaven and progress and evolve to become a God themselves. The Pope is saying, and Christianity in general is saying, that this religion isn't actually Christian, even though they believe in Jesus. There's a lot of people who believe in Jesus. Muslims believe in Jesus. There are Jews for Jesus. There are different Gnostic groups that believe in Jesus. But just because you believe in Jesus doesn't make you Christian. You have to have the actual truth that Jesus Christ himself taught and not a counterfeit. Yeah, that's a really good point because, you know, Jesus can mean anything to anybody. And so to just say, I believe in Jesus, you really have to ask, who are you speaking about? Exactly. And in fact, I have a video. It's called 10 Things That Mormons Won't Tell You. And I never expected more than 30 people to see it. But so many Mormons, I have over 6,000 comments on it from Mormons and ex-Mormons and everyone in between now. But one of the comments that I got very often, so often, in fact, I decided to make a whole separate video on the topic, was that, hey, why are you making fun of us? We're Christians, too. To which my reply was, I'm not making fun of you. <laughs> I don't like to make fun of any religion. I'm just giving facts that I think you should tell people that you don't seem to tell people or aren't honest with up front. Second, just because you believe in Jesus, it's not enough. I mean, we have so many different beliefs. I mean, a lot of Muslims, most Muslims think that Christian Christianity commits the unforgivable sin. It's called shirk in Islam. And shirk is the only unforgivable sin, and that is attributing somebody to the same level as God himself. We are saying that Jesus is God or the Son of God or something close to God in the Muslim eyes, and so they're saying that is wrong. It's, it's an unforgivable sin. Nobody's close to God. So they have a completely different understanding of Jesus Christ. And in fact, when you look at Mormon beliefs, while we hold a lot of similarities, we actually have many more differences, and the differences are drastic. 
Yeah, and, and I think part of the problem, like you said, is that it's pseudo-Christian. It appears that language is the same or similar. Uh, the expressions are the same and similar. But when you start talking to them and digging down, the, they really have very radically different understanding of those terms. Absolutely. And in fact, they don't really do this. And I can't say that the majority of Mormons do this, but they went through a phase for a little while where they would come up to your door and say, hey, did you know that we're Mormons? And what religion are you? And I would say Catholic. They'd say, great. Did you know that there is no difference between Mormon religion and our uh, and the Catholic religion, except for one book, the Book of Mormon. Um, so I said, really? Because we believe in the Trinity as Catholics. And they would say, oh, well, we believe in the Trinity too. But they wouldn't tell you they have a completely different understanding of what the Trinity is, and it's a completely different teaching. So they would try to find common ground, you know, and kudos to them for trying to find common ground. But I think that they did it in a intellectually dishonest way. And, and granted, the Mormon missionaries are around 21, 22 years old, somewhere around there. So, you know, they're learning as they go. But the bottom line is there are very big differences between Mormons and Catholics and just Christianity in general. Yeah, you actually, you anticipated my next question. Uh, I think a, a lot of the, the, the younger Mormons really uh, aren't, uh, they don't really know some of the deep doctrines of Mormonism that in a way, they're somewhat kind of unaware of how different they are because uh, they, they've been spoon-fed, you know, their teachings since they were young. Yes, I'm going to back up for a moment just to inform our listeners so we can all be on the same page that Mormonism is a religion of revelation. It was delivered around 1829. Uh, Joseph Smith was a man who believed that he saw an angel in the same way that Muhammad, the founder of Islam, and Mary Baker Eddy, and uh, a lot of the other religious leaders, like uh, Ellen Gould White, Seventh-day Adventist, they all believed that they had an encounter with Jesus or an angel and started their own religion. Now, Joseph Smith was only about 18 years old in 1829, and he grew up in New York. And this angel told him that some plates, some golden plates, were buried near his house in New York. And these golden plates were revelations from God that had been hidden, and it was his job, and God called him to dig up these plates, even though he did it many, many, many years later. And he translated these plates, even though he never went to school, and the, the plates became what we know today as the Mormon scriptures, the Book of Mormon. Now, okay. Well, actually, you know, Brian, I hear the, the music coming up. Uh, that's actually sure. a good place to stop. We'll pick it up on the other side of the break. We're talking with Brian Mercer about Mormonism and uh, the Book of Mormon. So stay tuned. A lot more to come after this break. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please 
prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody. We are chatting with Catholic Brian. Yes, Master Apologist Brian Mercer is on the show. And talk about Mormonism. And before the break, uh, Brian was just uh, telling us a little bit about the origins of this religion. It is a uniquely American-based religion. And, uh, Brian, you were talking about how young Joseph Smith uh, purportedly received a revelation about uh, golden plates that recorded the, uh, the, the uh, sacred history of revelation and that he translated the plates. Uh, you, you could just take it from there, I guess. Sure. And uh, he purported to translate the plates, and it, that's what we know today as the Book of Mormon. And he apparently... Uh, allegedly showed these plates to other people. There were uh, many different witnesses that saw the plates, and there were people who allegedly saw the plates, although if you actually look at the texts themselves and the witnesses' accounts themselves, no one actually saw the plates. Some claimed to see them in a vision when they were sleeping. Others claimed that they saw them under a tarp. (laughs) Um, But the fact is there were three witnesses, and there were eight witnesses in the beginning of the Book of Mormons, but none of them actually saw the plates. And if it was me, I would have questioned why he wouldn't let somebody, if it was just under a tarp, why he wouldn't uh, see the plates. And I believe Joseph Smith was put in jail twice in his life, and I believe the first time was for deceiving people and being a nuisance. (laughs) But the fact is he's kind of a a shady character. And one of the Mormons I was talking to said that he was a fallen prophet. Uh, But the bottom line is he founded Mormonism, and he he talked to the, um, the angel. He also encountered two people who he said was God the Father and God the Son. He said they both appeared to him, and they were both in body forms, meaning that the Bible is wrong, that John 24, 24 says God is spirit, but Mormonism teaches that God has a body of flesh and bones. And if you see God, if you could tear away this veil of this world and see him in heaven, you will see him just as we are now, a man, an exalted man who became a god. And so you have the Book of Mormon, but Mormonism itself is also, consequently, a religion of revelation, ongoing revelation. So Joseph Smith was the first prophet, but they've had different prophets ever since. And prophets can have revelations from God all the time and can change things from one day to another, which is one of the biggest things that frustrates me about Mormonism is they can't make up their minds. And God, who is infinitely perfect and cannot change his mind, often does and has to backtrack. And I'm sure we'll get to that in a little while. But let me just say that Uh, The Book of Mormon is the account of a civilization and a people who supposedly lived here in America long before people actually lived in America. They were a group of Israelites who journeyed over, and Jesus came to the Americas. That's right. Jesus came to the United States after his resurrection to preach to the people in America the gospel truth of who he is. Now, the gospel... As, you, I, as I think I heard you saying on the show earlier, the Book of Mormon is a plagiarism of the King James Bible, which is pretty true in a lot of areas. But yeah. you will also see a lot of additional Lamanites, Nephites, and different, different civilizations here that supposedly lived, even though actual historical societies in America say that the Book of Mormon just isn't true. 
Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I think they were, uh, apologists have been able to narrow down the exact edition of the King James <laughs> that was used in the Book of Mormon <laughs> uh, from the errors that were in there. Well, that's not even, you know what? That's the good part of it. That's that's not even the worst part. The good part is that the Book of Mormon, because it plagiarized from the King James, is actually pretty accurate. The Book of Mormon actually talks about how Jesus Christ is the very eternal God, one with the Father. It speaks in very mono, um, monotheistic terms. But then, because it's a revelation religion, they had later revelations, and Joseph Smith decided to change his mind because God appeared to him many times, and they had other revelations called Doctrine and Covenants, which is another book of theirs, The Pearl of Great Price, uh, and other um, revelations like that. So Doctrines and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, uh, the uh, King Follett's Discourse, other these things talk about there being many gods, it talks about doctrines that are totally different than what the actual Book of Mormon talks about. In fact, if you talk about the Book of Mormon, most Mormons won't talk to you about it. Most of their odd beliefs don't come from the Book of Mormon. They come from later revelations. Yeah. And some of those contradict earlier revelations, but that's just the way Mormonism works. In fact, most people know that polygamy was practiced for a long time in the Mormon religion, but then when the United States government came in and threatened the Mormon religion and to kind of wipe them out using military use if they needed to, all of a sudden there was a revelation saying that, oh, God doesn't want polygamy anymore, even though Brigham Young, who was their second president, had said it's an eternal doctrine and it's an absolutely necessary doctrine in order to get into the kingdom of heaven and to become a God yourself. So he said it was an everlasting doctrine and it was necessary, and anyone who doesn't practice it will be damned. His words, not mine. <laughs> yeah, uh, but that again, explains those splinter groups we hear about uh, that are polygamous as well. They're basically the ones that are following this older revelation. Correct, and they believe that they're the true Mormon religions, even though the Mormon religion we know today as Latter-day Saints or LDS they believe that they're uh, offshoots of the Mormon religion, but they're saying, no, we still keep to the original tenets of Mormonism, which is why we're the true religion. And in fact, Mormonism actually taught at one point that blacks were cursed by God, and in some sense, they still do. Because in the second book of Nephi, in the book of Mormon, chapter 5, it talks about how black people received uh, a curse because they disobeyed God and wouldn't follow him. And the curse was black skin and uh, related to that, all dark skinned people, which would include Hispanics and um, Indians and different dark skinned people. This was the mark that they did not follow God. See, in the Book of Mormon, there were Lamanites who were cursed and didn't follow God. Then there were Nephites who were God followers and who were faithful to God. But uh, many of the people who actually didn't follow God, received black skin. And it wasn't until 1978 that there was a new revelation saying that it was okay for blacks to join the Mormon priesthood. That's very new. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what the precursor to that was? It uh, was, uh, I, do not. I, I believe it was uh, network television was going to uh, boycott BYU uh, uh, sporting events because uh, they wouldn't allow blacks in the priesthood or something like that. And then it was a few weeks later, they had this revelation, and uh, they flip-flopped on it. Correct. And I see that in the whole history of um, Mormonism. And if you look at Joseph Smith's revelations, they've changed a lot, too. I mean, he has different accounts at different times of his life, of things that he purported, and there's differences in his story. But the basics of it is, is that, God and Jesus, God the Father and Jesus, appeared to him and told him that all religions on earth were false. Maybe mo most Mormons will admit or could admit that the Catholic Church was started by Jesus. That's good. But they believe that at some point after the death of the last apostle, the church became corrupt. There was a lot of persecution by the Roman Empire, so good Christians were killed off, and then other Christians were just won over by the paganism, and so it became a hybrid, but all of Christianity was lost, and there were no good people left on the face of the earth, and God therefore took the priesthood authority off the earth for almost 
1,600, 1,500 years until the time of Joseph Smith in 1829 when he decided to restore it. So Joseph Smith was the prophet who restored original Christianity, so they say, and they believe, the Mormons believe that they are the true religion because they are the apostasy restored. Yeah, that's, it's called a great apostasy, right? That uh, the Christia, true Christianity disappeared from the earth and that uh, it was through Joseph Smith's revelation that it's restored. Did they ever nail down exactly when the great apostasy happened? <laughs> that is one of my favorite questions to ask. <laughs> Mine too. And I've asked, <laughs> I've asked many Mormons, and I actually have a book here that I'm not supposed to have. It's called The Great Apostasy. It's by James Talmadge. And the Mormons, after meeting with me for nine months, wanted to convince me of it. So they gave me their whole book on the subject. And I read it and tore it apart. I wrote in the margins. Point, I mean, there's just hundreds of errors in this book. It's historically uh, sophomoric. But they said it was just to, for me to lend. I didn't know they would. <laughs> but I kept it. I didn't mean to. And in the book, it doesn't give any timeline of the great apostasy. It gives a lot of generalizations. And it says sometime after the last of death apostle. But if you look closely in the apostasy, it talks about persecutions against the church, which helped lead to the first uh, full apostasy. Now, these persecutions talked about in this book were by Diocletian and the Emperor Trajan and different Roman emperors. We're talking the two and three hundreds here. This yeah. isn't shortly after the death of the last apostle anymore. So I put it to the Mormons. I said, when did it actually happen? You said it was after the death of the last apostle. That's your talking point. Here, it's hundreds of years later, and Christianity is still being persecuted. And we know from Eusebius, who lived through this great, uh, this great persecution time, Eusebius said that the people went into hiding. They were hiding out in catacombs underground. They were being persecuted. But once Constantine legalized Christianity, they all came out from hiding. And Christians, thousands and thousands of them still existed and filled the churches to praise and glorify God, showing that there was Christianity before the persecution and after the persecution. And if you read the earliest Christian writings, they fiercely fought against paganism, Gnosticism, and anything that contradicted the uh, Christian faith. So there could be, and there was no great apostasy, and they could even admit that they had no idea when it actually took place. Yeah, that's that's really interesting, because that is really what the whole religion is about, because if there wasn't an apostasy, there couldn't be a restoration. Exactly. If no apostasy happened, then the Mormon church isn't true. And in fact, one of the claims that I have in my Mormon video, and this is what Mormons have always taught, is that St. John, one of the 12 apostles who hold the priesthood authority of Christ himself. Mm -hmm. he, I'll wait till the end of the break. <laughs> okay. Well, that's a good cliffhanger to stop on. We're talking with uh, Catholic Brian, Brian Mercer, about Mormonism and uh, very interesting material. Stay tuned. A lot more to come. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support 
because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody. For those just tuning in, we are chatting with Master Apologist Brian Mercer about Mormonism. And we're talking about the Joseph Smith as a prophet, uh, the advent of the Book of Mormon, its consequent revelation and uh, right before the break, we were talking about the the Mormon theory of the great apostasy and exactly when it occurred. And Brian, I know where you're going with this, Brian. I can't wait to hear it. Uh, <laughs> uh, you brought up uh, the Apostle John as a problem with the great apostasy theory. Correct. All the apostles, unlike Catholic belief, where we believe only Peter received the keys, they believed all the apostles received the key, which symbolized authority. And all of those keys were taken off the earth because everybody became corrupt and left the Christian teaching. And so God pulled the Christian religion from the earth only to restore it many, many hundreds of years later. Now, the problem with that is St. John, they believe, still walks on earth today. They believe he's still alive. And therefore, he is one of the original holders of the priesthood and authority. Therefore, not all the authority has left the earth. Not every person became corrupt, and not everyone was bad. And therefore, it kind of undermines their whole position of the great apostasy. And in fact, if you read the Book of Mormon, there's actually three Nephites who were also given permission to live on earth forever. So the, the Mormons believe that they're walking the earth right now. And I've asked Mormons when they come to my house, I've talked to them for a long time, week after week, and I asked them, why in 2,000 years has not one single person had a St. John sighting? No newspaper, no TV, nobody in the history of the world has seen St. John or heard of St. John, even though you say he's out there baptizing and making converts. Right. Yeah, very good. Yeah, and and the answer? Uh, they don't really have an answer, uh, not a very good answer. <laughs> it's not a very well-thought-out argument. What they usually try to do is go to the Bible and talk about the different passages that talk about an apostasy. Um, and in one particular passage they talk about, ironically, it kind of backfires in their face. Uh, it's an Old Testament passage, and it talks about a great apostasy and how everybody's going to leave the faith and this and that. And so we always go to this book, and uh, for some reason I'm blanking out on, on the top of my head right now. I never blank out on it, but uh, this book, if you go and read it, it actually says there's a great apostasy. That's true. But when you go to the first verse and read it in context, it says, to my people in Jerusalem. So it's specifically talking about the Israelites and an apostasy at a certain place in time, not a worldwide apostasy as uh, they actually try to construct. And in fact, they the, the, the Bible verse actually disproves them because it actually goes on to say in chapter 9, the very next chapter, that God is going to restore that apostasy with his Messiah, and it's going to be an everlasting restoration, and he's going to make an everlasting covenant with his people that can never be broken. And we know that that's the New Testament covenant with the New Testament church, the Catholic church, and, and it actually disproves that point because it agrees with Matthew 16, 18, that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And there's just no way that Jesus his church can die. 
Yeah, yeah, very good. Uh, yeah, I, and uh, you know the Great Commission, go, uh, you know, preach the gospel, all people, and lo, I'll be with you to the end of the age. Well, how can that possibly be if it's within their lifetime, everybody apostatizes and everyone forgets the actual gospel? Doesn't make a lot of sense. Exactly. And there's a lot of Mormonism that doesn't make uh, a lot of sense, including Jesus coming to America (laughs) and and many other things. But some of the biggest problems that I have with Mormonism are their doctrines. And one of their doctrines is that God was once a man just like we are. And in fact, there's a great debate I recommend um, by Patrick Madrid. It's it's called the First Catholic Mormon Dialogue. Have you heard of it? Oh, yeah. I listen to a lot. Yeah. It's a great dialogue, and it's not a debate. You actually get to hear both sides. But something shocking, the Mormon uh, LDS leader says, and he says that God was just a man who had normal sexual relationship with his wife, uh, Mary. But I don't know if she was exactly his wife, but they had conjugal relations in order to have Jesus. And I was shocked when I heard that, and I've told you know, Mormon bad. And I said, what do you guys think of this? And I tell them about the debate. But the fact is, Brigham Young taught that God was just a man who, you know, kind of brought about life the same way every other man brings about life. It's not a big deal, according to the early Mormons. And some even believe that since marriage was an eternal doctrine, you had to get married. Some uh, Mormon prophets theorized that even Jesus was married and had multiple wives, and you can see that in their quotes. But the biggest thing for me is that that's blasphemy to say that God, eternal, almighty, from everlasting to everlasting, is reduced to a mere man who became God. That's yeah. blasphemy. And in fact, it's the first uh, temptation of the devil, is it not? That if you eat from this tree, you will become God's. And so Mormons believe that in the same way that God became God, that they can become God. And they have a phrase, uh, a famous saying in Mormonism, as God once was, so we can become. And so that's why they believe there's many, many, many gods throughout the universes inhabiting different planets, um, having relations with their spirit life and creating uh, whole populations of people for their own planets. And uh, I mean... Besides how insane this is, they I have to be fair that they don't worship all of these other gods. They only worship one god, they say, and they don't worship the gods of the other planets. That's for other people on those planets to worship. But the fact that they believe they're out there when the Bible says there's only one god is very problematic. Now, Mormons will misuse the, the Bible just like Jehovah's Witnesses will, many Protestant religions will, and this is the problem with Sola Scriptura. If you go just by the Bible, you're going to encounter an infinite amount of problems, and textbook case A is Mormonism, because they will go to countless passages where it says that God drew with his finger to create the Ten Commandments. God, um, in the book of Acts, It says that I saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. And they take all these physical, symbolic descriptions of God, and they say, see, God has a body. And I point out John 4, 24, that says God is spirit. He can't have a body. Therefore, these are just symbols. But they're convinced that God has a body. And they'll appeal to Corinthians, the book of Proverbs, which says there are many gods. And we don't worship those gods. They're false gods because we only worship one. But there are many gods out there. And this is the problem with just millions of people interpreting the Bible any way they want to. Yeah, so they take anthropomorphic language where, you know, uh, we describe God in humanly terms and say, no, that's literal. Uh, he literally has, a, you know, there is a hand of God. There is a finger of God. God has a body. Uh, and uh, and they also, they they really center on, like, the more obscure passages, especially when it says things that we're not exactly sure what is going on, like baptism for the dead. Uh, you know, that, go ahead. I, I, I'm just naming a few of those. No, I completely agree with you. You're you're right on. And um, that's one of the issues I take with Mormonism is their abysmal biblical interpretation. They'll take obscure passages and create whole doctrines around them, like there are many gods. 
Well, therefore, okay, there's gods inhabiting other planets. But in fact, the gods that the Bible is talking about are the false gods that the pagan nations worshipped. I mean, they worshipped trees sometimes and animals and calves, and that's why they made a golden calf. And they were they basically worshipped all these other gods, but these other gods didn't actually exist. They weren't real. The people just thought they were real, which is why they were false gods, and that's what the Bible is condemning. I tell Mormons all the time, it's not endorsing gods on other planets. Same thing with uh, polygamy. And it's the same thing, as you mentioned, with uh, baptism of the dead. There's one verse in the book of Corinthians that mentions baptism for the dead. And it doesn't even say that it's a Christian practice. Paul actually just mentions it in passing. And he, he's making the point that the resurrection is real. And the point is, most scholars think that this wasn't referring to Christian practice, because there's not a shred of evidence, not a single document, not even a letter anywhere that ever has shown that Christians practiced baptism for the dead. But we do have scholarly works that show that pagans did practice forms of baptism for the dead uh, around Corinth, where Paul was talking, right to the west and to the north. So it's believed that Paul was referring to saying, hey, look, even these pagan People believe in a resurrection from the dead, and you don't, even though Jesus himself rose. So they take one obscure passage that literally just mentions it and doesn't say it's good or bad, and they make a whole doctrine around it. Same thing with John the Apostle. They find one passage in the Bible that says John, uh, uh, someone made a rumor that John was going to live forever, and they say, oh, see, John lived forever, even though two <laughs> verses later it specifically <laughs> says that he, that he wasn't going to live forever, that some people said they thought he was going to live forever. So that's one of the biggest problems I have with Mormonism. I actually, Mormons are the nicest people, which is why I make videos on this to help them, because they're so nice, but yet they've been born into a religion that's not only not Christian, it's far from Christian. It has so many beliefs and teachings that are against the real Jesus, which is why when people leave and they find the real Jesus, Mormons, ex-Mormons will say that, you know, I just love Jesus even more now. I love this understanding of who God is now. It makes much more sense. Excellent. Well, where can people go to uh, get a hold of all your stuff, Ryan? Well, the, the easiest place to find me is my website, current website, catholicbrian.org, B-R-Y-A-N. Or they can just look up Catholic Brian, B-R-Y-A-N. I would love people to check out my YouTube channel or follow me on social media, Catholic Brian. Very good. Yeah, and folks, uh, go to YouTube, check out Catholic Brian, check out those videos on Mormonism because we just barely scratched the surface. Brian, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. All right, well... Uh, yeah, that I, <laughs> we'll have to have them back because there's just so much to talk about. And uh, like I said, that's just a brief summary of uh, uh, some of the things uh, in Mormonism. A lot of things that people don't know about them. Uh, coming up next week, we got a huge lineup. We're going to have Dr. Paul Thigpen coming to the dojo along with Carlo Broussard, Ken Hensley, and Carl Keating. Uh, some heavy, heavy duty uh, heavyweights, I guess, coming into the dojo. And, man, the hour is over. Can you believe it, folks? It's already time for me to shut down the Midwest Command Center over here and turn off the dojo lights. It's been a lot of fun to be with you today. I hope you enjoyed the program. Uh, coming up next, high-intensity Catholic talk with the dynamic duo of the Terry and Jesse show. Hope everybody has a great weekend. And, God willing, we'll see each other Monday. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. In the 1990s, I lived and worked in Hollywood. But when my wife Betty's mom took ill, we relocated to Orange County. And it was during this time in our lives that I converted to Catholicism. Once my eyes were opened to the truth, I couldn't learn enough about the faith. But I had less free time than ever, especially with a long commute. That's when I discovered the real value of Catholic audio. Listening to cassette tapes transformed my daily commute into a miniature retreat. And that's the beauty of Virgin Most Powerful Radio today. Since the podcasts are archived, 
you can listen anytime on our smartphone app. I know how listening to Catholic audio can bring you closer to Christ and His Church. So I encourage you to visit the App Store or go to vmpr.org and download the app today. It just might change your life. I'm Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Virgin Most Powerful Radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity.